What a pleasure to be here. It really is. Now, in my talk, which is there, um, there's a lot happening in our lives just now uh, relating to energy systems and a very profound change in energy systems. Um, and uh, you see all the things that are happening at the strategic level, like wind turbines going out, marine turbines. It's coming into our cities, and there's all sorts of uh, concepts being discussed. Now, these are profoundly uh, changing the boundaries of the energy system, so they're really pushing the boundaries. And the first message I'd like to bring to you is we're pushing in the wrong direction. We're going to end up in a bit of a mess if we're not careful. And I'd like to explain why, and then I'd like to explain what we might do about it to turn the corner in a different direction. So we start just at the top there, and in this audience, there'll be many different views about energy, and there's a little compendium of those views. Some people think it's absolutely a moral obligation to create environments that bring health and well-being to people, and that's a good thing. If we do that, we will need to spend energy. Other people say it's about uh, saving the planet, and it's about carbon reduction. If we do that, that could be good, but it also might create more fuel poverty, raise the price of energy. Everything's got a good and a bad. Other people will talk about biodiversity. Others are concerned about making the fossil fuels last longer because our economies are predicated on them. And if they begin to go too rapidly, we're in trouble, even to the extent of wars in the world. Others are talking about replacement, what new fuel types can we bring on, and yet others are talking about security. Whatever we do, can we grow it locally? Does that mean we'll have energy crops? Does that mean we'll have energy crops which are um, uh, uh, displacing uh, uh, arable land? At the bottom, there's the technological things we can do. We could try to control the world's populations. It's not a subject I care to discuss today. It's not an option. Or we could try to say to people, if you all save a little, do a little, we'll save a lot. That's an absurdity in extremis. If we all do a little, we'll save a little. So we would all have to do a lot. And I think most of you in this room will not do what would be required to reduce the energy burden. So we might start to uh, develop new technologies and put them out, a technological solution. That's possible, but it has downside. And we might go to the supply side clean the fossil fuels at some considerable expense. We might uh, introduce renewables. We'll look at that in a second. Or we might uh, uh, re reactivate the whole nuclear question. Uh, David Mackay, uh, professor at Cambridge University, uh, he's the just retired uh, chief ad uh, scientific advisor to the Department of Energy and Climate Change, a very influential person, very clever person. And he did a wonderful thing a few years ago. He took the statistics for the UK and he reduced them to a personal statistic. Kilowatt hours, energy unit, per day, per person. These are the consumptions you each make on average. So if I ask you to change your lifestyle to reduce the energy burden, you would need to stop buying stuff. Don't have new mobile phones, don't have watches, don't have new fashion, don't buy stuff. But our society would grind to a halt in the current political systems if that happened. It's not an option. If we go for options like the built environment or transport, if we can even replace that at 1% per year, that's 70 years to get to half the stock. So we're talking about 200 years to make any impact if we try to make things more efficient. Uh, just by using, you know, making a car more efficient or using less transit journeys and doing it in some other way. On the other side is uh, the Department of Energy and Climate Change 2020, uh, 2050 Energy Pathways tool, which you can play. Uh, you can become the master of the universe and, and, and bring up different changes. And there's a scenario of an all-renewable all future. And in red there, you see what we would need to do to begin to match demand in the UK uh, with renewable supply. We'd need to uh, turn over an area the size of Wales uh, to uh, energy crops. We would need to deploy a new wind farm every week for the next 50 years. 
What a build that is. This is tantamount to the industrialization of the landscape at a scale you cannot conceive of. So when people go around saying the future, the solution's renewable, it may well be, but that will be over a very long period of at least 100 years until we resolve some of the really difficult issues about catching the world's most distributed, low power density, stochastic resource, as opposed to fossil fuels, which is solar energy in a high density power package that's transportable. That displacement is a huge challenge for humankind. So, the burden has been moving quite rapidly to the built environments, to the concepts related to future cities, where perhaps we can get individuals in the world to start to think more sustainably and do things and, and move the means of energy production into cities and energy centers and you have concepts like smart grids. The, the, the IQ of the smart grid at the moment is about room temperature, like 20 deep 20. It's not very smart, and it won't be for a while. But as we make these displacements, look at the little things at the bottom. So we don't build a power station and we put combined heat and power in our cities. We reduce global emissions and we say, hooray, we're saving the planet. But you've moved those emissions into the breathable zone. Who's checking air quality locally if you're simply filling in a form that says we've met our carbon saving targets? There's something not right in the way that we're thinking about how we transit to a future that hasn't got fossil fuels. And there's other things that can happen there that we see around the world. There's what the government's doing to stimulate all of this. Now the government, for example, in the Department of Energy and Climate Change, has very, very credible uh, economists. And they know how to shift markets. So they know the fiscal measures of tax and spend, or tax and subsidy in this case, that they can put in place to change the way uh, people will behave. And it works. And I'm not against that. That's a good thing. So there's a summary of all the things they've been doing. The non-fossil fuel obligation, the Scottish Renewables Order, failed. So they substituted it with the renewables obligation. That allowed the utilities to make a lot of money, and if it's wind farms, landowners to make a lot of money. It's begun to fail because it doesn't bring certainty of investment to the industry. So there's the electricity market reform, which now is a thing called strike price, where you agree in advance how much you'll get for your power. Lots of money being made. Lots of really fat cats in this business. Fiscal measures. Will that succeed? Doubt it. Then Green Deal, where you try to tell the population that should take loans and do energy efficiency things, because someone who doesn't understand thermodynamics tells you that's a good thing to do. Or renewable heat incentive. These are fiscal measures. They're not backed, they're not addressing any of the technical feasibility of systems or how to attain targets. They're simply fiscal. And when we go that route, there's what happens. That's what we're seeing just now. There's nothing wrong with fiscal measures if backed by the other side of the scale, the balance. But that balance, frankly, friends, is not there. So we see unreliable systems going out. Almost all systems that are heralded as green and efficient and innovative, when you measure them, they don't work. Now, I'm being contentious to make the point, but you'll be shocked when you actually look at what's happening with the way these systems are performing. No wind farm has ever displaced a conventional power plant. We don't put a wind farm up and turn off a conventional plant. We just keep both. And then you have to regulate the wind farm off and pay someone money to keep it off in order to balance the voltage in the network. And that's an issue you can address and perhaps rectify through control. But that's going to take a while as well. And who would then have the backup capacity? Increased uh, demand supply gap. Worsens the cost burden. Everyone's feeling it. Costs are rocketing. Fuel poverty is going up everywhere. That's the price of sustainable energy. Really? Is that what we want? And so on. You can read for yourself. So what's the problem exactly? 
So as it says at the top, we've got fiscal measures which do not take account of thermodynamics, how things actually work. We just say things. Photovoltaics is good. Is it? What's the thermodynamics tell us about photovoltaics? So all the decisions we're making are actually ill-informed about the consequences of those decisions. That's a paradox. We live in an information society where we never know the consequences of the decisions we're making at the time we make the decision. That clearly can't be right. Governments say we set targets. We don't decide how you get there. We leave that to the industry. And I think the industry has to be really pushed now by society. The little bit below is my this and the next bit, a wee bit techie thing. There's the four principles of all energy systems that are absolutely disregarded. All energy systems are dynamic. They change all the time. They change at a different rate of change. So they're never in steady state, they're dynamic. So if we say a PV panel has an efficiency of 15% or a condensing boiler 90%, that's a lie. That's like saying a car will give you 40 miles per gallon. Yes, if you put it through a standard test and you make sure it's light as you can and low friction tires. That's not what you'll get in practice. These things are outcomes from a system. They're not inputs. And yet we're being told, oh, that's an efficient way to do something. No one can a priori know that. It depends on how it interacts with the whole dynamic system. Everything's non-linear. All the parameters change as a function of the state variables. So, you know, material properties change as a function of temperature and so on. The system's systemic. It's got acoustic comfort, visual comfort, um, um, thermal comfort. It's got controllability. It's got uh, capital costs, running costs, maintenance costs, environmental emissions, material use, embodied energy. It's a systemic big system. And yet industry loves to take out their little bit and tell you how that will save the planet. And that's the more efficient thing to do. Who are they trying to fool? Us, because that's the sales model. And lastly, everything's, there's lots of stochastic processes, weather, people, and if we don't take these into account, then we're in trouble. So there's my strap line. If you're coping with complexity and you don't take account of these things, don't bother building it. So if you can't simulate something, if you can't model it in advance and say it will work in this way or that, don't bother doing it because it will not work. So this is what I think the information age should be all about. I regard computers not as something to sell, which is all they do at the moment, but as a way to help uh, society and humanity understand how complex systems work and therefore make better decisions. You can make money out of that. You can monetize that. But that's the real raison d'etre of the computer revolution, joining the virtual world to the real world. That's how it works. You take the real world, you divide it into lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of finite volumes and you conserve energy, mass and momentum. And from that, you can go in and do anything you like and you can say, and will that be better? Will that be worse? And what will that cost? And what will the temperatures be? Will people be comfortable? Is that good air quality? What's the emissions? Because you're simulating the real world. Here's a little computational story for you. I want to design a low energy community in Glasgow. What I would expect to do is go in and set the geometry up. The city's now got full 3D model of the city. So you go and pick up your part, invent the little part that you don't have. Then you might go and visualize it, talk to your client about what you're trying to do. Then you might you know, start clothing it with constructions, looking at uh, these constructions, how they might work, if they get low embodied energy. Then you might choose a boundary condition, look at glare distribution, make sure people will be uh, visually comfortable. Then you might look at free light, put a photocell in, capture that, displace electrical use. Then you might put your biomass boiler, boiler plant in your community. Then you might put your PV in because you want renewable integration. Then you might check that the uh, in, indoor environment's good. 
uh, then you might bring in your low voltage network and make sure you can balance your, um, your power. Behavior follows description. That's just one little simple example. So that we're sitting there in a society where we expect participatory democracy in the way we move forward with making decision making. Even occupants of buildings, citizens in the city can participate in this with professionals who know how to make different models, commission the simulations. And the outcome of that is an integrated view of performance. So we start to trade about, if we do it this way, this is what will happen. You can see some good things and some bad things. That's an objective truth. Nothing is perfect. So if we make an adaptation, we can improve the thing we don't like, it is bad, but we'll trade off with something else. There's no such thing as an ideal solution. But we make it overt. We bring it up front. These things are published. We can compare things. In order to do this, we would need to change the way we practice the business of designing cities and so on. And that means we have to get uh, our new graduates into offices throughout the world in design practice who are able to do things like that, make models, calibrate them, commission simulations, get in together in a meeting, discuss the results, hypothesize, postulate a change that fixes a problem, implement that in a model. I'll tell you something, it's cheaper, it's better, and it's quicker than anything we've ever had before. And we're then in an experiential world. You'd expect to be able to understand something, even if you were a lay person. So you can say, no, I don't like that, whether it's visualization, whether it's looking at voltage stability in the network going above a limit, whether it's looking at glare, whether it's looking at the outdoor environment and the lighting revolution we're going to have coming up soon, whether it's looking at uh, people comfort and health and contaminants. We're now in a virtual world which connects directly to the real world because it has the embodiment of the future realities. And to go back to some of the very inspirational talks earlier, one of the keys to health is mindfulness, being in the present. So being in a virtual reality, it's your present it may be a future present, but you're exploring how things will work. That's healthy, and it works, and it will take us in a direction away from this nonsense of using greenwash to make money. Things to do with air quality. All of this will be placed in the Future Information Society, the so-called Internet of Things, where smart meters state monitoring, and using the simulation environments to simulate scenarios for the future. All that information is being captured together now in databases, and it will be used to make money by launching services, information services uh, to city planners, um, information services to citizens, giving them advice back about how they can save personally money, for example, or inc increase the env environmental quality for their children. Scotland has 240,000 homes that are suffering from really serious mold infestation. So I, for one, think that's a much more important issue than deploying uh, you know, green technologies all over the place because somehow we're going to reduce a carbon emission. We've got to get things in the right balance. Carbon emissions are a part of the story, but there's lots of other uh, things we have to do as well. So in conclusion, it seems to me that we really need to prioritize the system, the energy system as a holistic problem. We need to look at the top bit there about making sure our cities work well, our healthy places. We need to make sure that the fossil fuels are absolutely guarded, cherished for what they are. They've given us where we've reached on every objective function I can think of. The world is a better place now than it was in the past. We're healthier, we're better educated, etc., etc. And to keep that going, we've got to replace the fossil fuels with all this new technology at the bottom, which is a really difficult thing to do. And the only way we're going to do that is if we get proper simulation technologies, the ultimate destiny of the computational sciences, to represent the real world and let humanity cope with complexity.
and we need to get that into our schools, our design practices, our municipalities, everywhere. It's the biggest challenge that, that I think we face to get this sorted out before we go much further. And if I had time, I'd give you some really horror examples with just simply deploying things against a fiscal model of, of change for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.